Good morning. I am Dennis Schmidt, the pastor of Dubuque Community Church. And if you want to see our slide today, you're going to see in today's message, we're going to focus on a strange encounter that occurred during the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. A paralyzed man was brought to Jesus to give him some physical healing, but he had to be lowered down through the roof because the crowds were so large. But first, before Jesus gave him a complete healing, he said this, your sins are forgiven. Well, that's the title of our message today, Your Sins Are Forgiven. Sin is the most politically incorrect word you can say. It inherently speaks of a God who has clear command and authority and our failure as human beings to respond correctly to those commands. The word sin, actually at its most simplest form, means to miss the mark or not to, to fulfill God's best for us. It's an archery term, and when an archer shoots an arrow at a, a, at a target, and you probably have seen this, it's a, a large target with concentric circles getting smaller and smaller until you get this, the, the very center part, and that, that is called the bullseye or the mark. Anything other than hitting the center point is missing the mark. That is what sin is. And that's when you see that so clearly, you understand what Romans 3.23 tells us, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us are hitting the bullseye in our life every day. We're somewhere else further out on the target Maybe at one point in my life, I wasn't even hitting the target itself. So we need to know that, that all sin is rebellion. We just said what sin is. And all sin is rebellion against a, God, a holy God and his clear commands. So God is the injured party and only he can forgive us. We need to realize that. Isaiah 43, 25, not on the screen, tells us, uh, God says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions. And I like this, for my own sake, he says that, and remembers your sins no more. Well, what we need to realize is that God wants to restore our relationship with us more than we even want to restore our relationship with him. And I'm reminded of this often. I, parents and children will have something come up between them, and usually it's something that the children did, uh, did something way off from what their parents uh, would have wanted or expected them to do, and then there's a break in the relationship, and I will talk to the parents, and they will often be the most heartbroken about it, more so than their children who actually did, broke the relationship. And the, the parents want the relationship restored more than the children do. Well, that's true for God, too. He wants to restore his relationship with us. And sin is what breaks that relationship. Well, as we continue to talk about sin, maybe a, another question might be, uh, how perfect a life do you need to earn heaven. We all want to die and go to heaven someday. How, how perfect a life do you have to earn on your own merit, doing it on your own merit, how, how perfect a life do you have to live to earn heaven? Well, you must live a completely perfect life to earn a perfect place, an eternal home called heaven. So if you're shooting at that, at that uh, uh, bullseye or that, that uh, target, you have to hit the bullseye every time. And of course, we know that we are missing that mark regularly. Maybe it once in a while might accidentally hit the mark, but other than, what, than that. So we know, need to know that. And we also know how many times do you have to miss the mark before you're disqualified from heaven on your own, by your own works? One time. 
It only takes one sin to disqualify you from getting to heaven. And that is why all of us sinners need forgiveness of sin or we will all perish because we will miss the mark very often, very often. This is also why it is so critical for us to understand how God, what God's plan is for delivering us from the earned results of our sins. And by the way, I called earned results. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. It's separation from God. So we need to realize that, that, uh, that uh, that's what we're earning when we sin. And you know, maybe if you're sitting there right now and you think, well, sin's not that big a deal. It's not that important to me. But just think about this for a moment. Somewhere in the future, you're laying on your deathbed, or maybe you are laying on your deathbed right now and you're watching this on TV or something like that. And you know that very soon you will be facing a holy God. Well, then the fact that your sins, or whether they are or not, is, is going to be very important to you. And if you have that peace to know that my sins are all forgiven, what a peaceful uh, transition you'll make into the next life. Well, we need to realize that right after uh, Adam and Eve uh, made their mistake clear back in the garden, they, they had, uh, God had promised them a Messiah, and we're not going to go over that again. They said, is it a Messiah who's going to come, who's going to deliver you from the mess that you got yourself in when, you, when they sinned against God in their rebellion in the garden? Well, sometime later, here we go in the New Testament, the book of the gospel, according to John, we, re, we re, read the recording, or excuse me, the proclamation given by John the Baptist, the forerunner, when he pointed to Jesus Christ, and he said in John 1.29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Well, the Jewish people knew all about lambs. They had a sacrifice. They would sacrifice a lamb that would save them from their sins. And literally, the Old Testament says that just covered their sins, covered it. It didn't say it took it, took it away. But now here comes the Messiah, the promised one that they've been waiting for. And John the Baptist accurately points to Jesus and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He eradicates them. He gets rid of them. So we got all this now, and, and we're out get back to this point where we're going to look at this strange encounter that we looked at right at the very beginning. And we're going to see that the deity, the, the, that Jesus Christ is God incarnate, and, and what he is going to say to this man is going to verify that, I believe, more than any other verse in the Bible. Because we remember that sin, all sin is against God, and only God, if you remember that verse from Isaiah, only God can forgive your sins. And yet we're going to see that Jesus is going to say your sins are forgiven, therefore declaring himself to be God in the flesh. Well, here we go now. It says a few days later, we're in the book of Mark now, the New Testament book of Mark. A few days later, Jesus again entered Capernaum, and the people heard that he had come home. Well, a few days later, and why it's saying this is because in Mark chapter 1, he had just healed a leper, and all these people were just amazed because leprosy in those days was a death sentence. And it was actually even worse than a death sentence because it was a slow, lonely death. You had to be separated from quarantine from all the people around you. You couldn't go near your family or friends. So you were separated from all of them. And your body begin, began, and still does, there's still leprosy, begins to rot away while you're still alive. And it had no natural cure at the time. And what it is, is I believe, an accurate picture of what sin does to our spiritual lives when when you have untreated sin in your life you will begin 
to, to, to lose y- your, your life uh, in, and your relationship with others around you. But Jesus has healed that man, and now he's, the people heard all about this, and he had come home. And by the way, Jesus' home really was Nazareth, but they said here in, in Capernaum, because it was just like 20 miles away, so it wasn't very far away from his home. The next verse is really important, verse 2. So many gathered there that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Well, here there's so many gathered. Why? They're all gathered. They're bringing their sick. They're bringing their hurting people because they had heard about this leper that had been healed. They were looking for uh, physical healing. And by the way, most people, when they come to the church, to a church even yet today, they come for some physical problem they have. Maybe it's a broken relationship. They're trying to restore their marriage. Or maybe their health is bad or something like that. They're not usually coming for spiritual needs Uh, But praise God, Jesus can heal both the physical need, he can restore the marriage, uh, and he can uh, forgive them from their sins, which we're talking about today. And and, uh, so uh, many times people come to all kinds of other reasons, but Jesus Christ knows that the most important reason that people need to come to him is so they can be saved from their sins, so that their immortal souls can be with God for for all eternity that is the most important part even if you have a physical healing if you no matter what your problem is and you get a healing you're still going to die someday but if you get healed spiritually you're going to spend eternity with god in heaven that's the most important thing we can do well here's where it gets where what's going on some men came bringing bringing to him a paralytic as we talked about earlier before carried by four of them it's a stretcher and there's one guy on each end of the stretcher there and these men are so concerned about their friend that they're carrying him over there he can't walk by himself he's a paralytic we don't know if he had an accident or an illness but he had no ability to walk so they're bringing him and then it says this uh, since They could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd. And this is important to realize. The crowds were so huge, they couldn't even get him to to Jesus. They made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. Well, you know, the first part of it says they couldn't get to Jesus. And uh, because the crowds were so large, it's really important us to realize there were large crowds following Jesus around. You know, sometimes uh, these false pseudo historians today say, oh, there really wasn't too many people following Jesus. He was just in a little corner down there. Nobody even knew about him. No, there were large crowds. Everybody knew about Jesus. And if you knew somebody that healed uh, somebody that had an incurable disease, the word would spread pretty quickly today as well but the crowds were large and i love this it said to get him to jesus the most important thing for any of us for any of our loved ones if someone has a problem is to get that person to jesus now how do we do that we try to get them to start reading the bible so they can read about jesus we we encourage them to go to church so that they can get there and gather together with other people But the bottom line is they need to get to Jesus. If you got a problem today, you got heartache and trials, you can call out to Jesus today. He's available to you. Well, these guys, they couldn't get to Jesus, so they made an opening in the roof. And, uh, you know, they planned, I'm sure, just come bring them up to Jesus, but they they couldn't get in, so they're going to plan B. They're not going to give up. They're, they refuse to go home without a blessing, which again is a good thing for all of us to say, you know, Jesus, I refuse to, to, I refuse to give up. I'm going to keep calling on you. I know you're going to heal me and, uh, or whatever I need, and I know you can forgive me for my sins. So here they are. They're digging through the roof. Uh, you know, and one of the things people think about, like a pitched roof like we have around here. Here in America, we live in a, 
uh, are here in the Midwest for sure. We got rain, we got snow. You can't have a flat roof around here very well without it leaking. But in, in Israel there where they lived, they almost all have flat roofs because there's very little rain and snow is almost unheard of. So what they do is they have a little steps going up to the roof and uh, during the day when the sun's real bright and hot, they're down in the house. But in the evening or in the morning, they go up and sit on the roof and get some sun and everything like that. So there was like an almost another room up on the top, but they're up there and they began to tear the roof open. So they literally had to dismantle the roof and they had to make a hole big enough that they could lower the, the man down through the roof. Well, as we go on, it says, When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Sons, son, your sins are forgiven. Well, Jesus saw their faith. They saw the faith of the man. He saw the faith of the men who were, who were uh, bringing him. And uh, you know what? This is kind of interesting. The guys that carried him in there, uh, now they were lowering him down through the roof. They counted on the fact that if they could get this man to Jesus, that he was going to be able to heal, heal them. You know, if he, Jesus didn't heal him, they're going to have to hoist him back up out of the, through the roof where they lowered him down. So they were counting on the fact that Jesus was going to heal him. And I believe as Jesus saw these men... Uh, ripping open the roof. I can imagine, I could just see Jesus looking up and the sawdust is falling down and everything. And he sees these guys open that roof and lot, let down uh, those, the, 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 the ropes, the guy with ropes, and he saw their faith. He really began to understand how real their faith was. And they were believing that Jesus was going to heal their good friend. And, but now here's the big thing. And by the way, uh, here's these guys' faith and, and the guy on the mat, but he says to the guy, the paralytic, son, by the way, meaning like my child, your sins are forgiven. You know, Jesus always answers our greatest needs first, and mo most of the time, if not all the time, that is a spiritual need. And he said, your sins are forgiven. I like what Warren Wiersbe said about this. He said, forgiveness is the greatest miracle that Jesus ever performs. It meets the greatest need. It costs the greatest price, which was Jesus' own blood. And it brings the greatest blessing and the most lasting results. Remember I said, even if you get physically healed, you're going to still die someday. But if you get spiritually healed, spiritually forgiven, that will last for all eternity. Well, it gets even more interesting. Now in the next verse it says, Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves. They did not say a word, and we're going to see again, the deity of the Lord Jesus. Jesus knew exactly what they were thinking, and this is what, what they were thinking. It, and here's what they were thinking. He said, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive God but Jesus alone? Well, he said, they said, who can forgive sin but God alone? First, they also said he's blaspheming, or they didn't say it, they thought it, which means to demean the character of God. And uh, really by Jesus saying, I can forgive your sins, they said, you're trying to take away from God something that only God can do. So that's how he's, they thought he was blaspheming them. And they had a great question. Who can forgive sin but God alone? That's a great question. The answer is there is no one else. But they come up with the wrong solution because their heart was so hardened toward Jesus that many of the people just refused to accept the fact that Jesus Christ was God incarnate. And, you know, you can see that. I mean, here's this human being there claiming to be God. Well, the next verse tells us something else very interesting. It says, immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that, that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Jesus, being God incarnate, 
knew their innermost thoughts and their innermost motivations. And by the way, he knows your thoughts and your motivations. And you know, sometimes I tell God, well, I'm doing this or that because I love God or I love my family. And then I think, you know what? I don't have to tell you that. You know. Maybe I'm kidding myself. Maybe I'm trying to kid somebody else. But God, you know exactly what my motivations are. So God always knows the truth. And he's asking them a question. Why are you thinking these things? Jesus often asks people questions to make them think about what they're doing. And then he asks another question. I love this one. And here's the next question he said. Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? He said, which is easier? Well, when you think about the two, uh, forgiveness of sin is impossible. If you think about healing a paralytic for human beings, that's impossible. And it's a legal, you know, it's really, a, a, I think, a, a logical assumption to believe that if Jesus has the power to heal this man, he also has the authority to forgive his sins. But it's really harder when Jesus says, uh, I'm going to uh, take, make you, have you get up and walk, than it is to say, I forgive your sins, because you can say, I forgive your sins, but I don't know, did, it, did my sins really get forgiven or not? But if you say, stand up and walk, and I'm a paralytic, and I stand up and walk, uh, that's that, the proof's in the pudding. So there it is. So he's, he's going to do that. So Jesus is allowing himself to actually be put to the test, praise God. In verse, the next verse it says, but that you may know, and this is the important part, God wants you to have complete assurance in the fact that, God, that Jesus is the Son of God and that he does have authority on earth to forgive sins. That's what he said, to forgive sins. He says to the paralytic, it's absolutely important that you know that Jesus can forgive your sins. And so here's what he tells them. He says, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. <laughs> well, you know, he, he's going to go back home, but it ain't going to be the old, it ain't going to be the old same person anymore. He's not paralyzed anymore. He's going to be a healthy man who now can take care of himself. He won't have to have anybody carrying him around. He can take care of his own house. He's going to have all kinds of responsibilities that he could not have, have fulfilled before. And this is what happens when Jesus heals us. And we're going to talk a little bit more uh, about some of the things that he heals us from. But when he heals us from them, he, he delivers us from these things that inca incapacitate us, that paralyze us that stop us from having a full and happy life, a productive life, when we're, where we can help other people around us. And many people I know that have, when they've come to Christ, including myself, went from being the person that everybody else was trying to help to be the one that was helping everybody else, and that's the way it should be. So anyway, he says, take, up, take your mat up and go home. And praise God, the next verse said, he got up, didn't, didn't say he had to learn how to walk or anything for a month or anything. He got up, took his mat, walked out in full view of them all. And, and, it, and it says, this amazed everyone. And they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Well, you know, here's where maybe I think more than a lot of people do. And I just stop and think, imagine if Jesus had failed that test. They had left the, that, the, the guy down slowly, and he did not get healed. And now this man, he's sitting there, and he's all disappointed. You know, I thought if I got to Jesus, he'd heal me, but he didn't. And all those naysayers and Pharisees and scribes would say, See, I knew Jesus couldn't heal him. You know, he's saying this, but, but he's saying that. What about the four men? that left the, 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 the man down, and they're looking at their friend, and he's all brokenhearted, and uh, now they went through all this work. They tore, they tore open somebody's roof. They're going to have to pay for that probably. How about the homeowner? <laughs> yeah, I just left Jesus come to my home, and now my ho I got a hole in my roof, you know? Uh, it, it, all this. But you know what? Jesus did come through, and he did heal the man. 
And, and all of these things did not happen because Jesus cannot fail. And, uh, you know, this is also true, too. When you think about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, people say, well, I don't know if Jesus really rose from the dead. Do you think all the whole world would have been filled with the, this word of God and all these men would have went all over the world and died and did all that if Jesus would have never rose from the tomb? No, it was because he did that, that, that the word just exploded around because everybody wanted to tell the good news. And of course, you know, the last verse said, we've never seen anything like this. And you know, many times... Uh, we have to put our trust in God, and when we do, then we will see mighty, miraculous things as well. You know, we're not going to talk, go to Peter, but Peter was the only one that got to walk on water because he's the only one that had enough faith to step out of the boat. Well, I love this next, next picture, though, even though it's just an artist's rendering. I, you know, I can just, I love it because it shows the change in the paralytic before they're carrying him in. And now here he is because of his faith and the faith of his friends. He's walking around. I mean, he's not, this thing, I like how he's got it on one shoulder. His other arm is swinging. He might be singing or whistling. And he's just walking out of here now, happy-go-lucky. And he's carrying what used to be his, his uh, tragedy, his his. Uh, para what stopped him from having a full life now he's got it on his shoulder like a little trophy and he's just walking around hey look at what I this is the mat I used to uh, lay on and now uh, I'm, I'm carrying it under one arm and you know when you're healed by God that's what will happen you know I know people who are delivered from drug addiction alcohol failed marriages accidents, mistakes, sins of every kind, pornography, adultery, greed, and they all, when they got saved, they all are trophies of the grace of God. And all of these things happened for one reason, and here's our final picture today. Remember in the beginning we said Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Verse 24, the next verse says, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. Well, remember in the very beginning, the title, Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. This is a statement. He didn't say some of your sins. He didn't say most of your sins. He said, your sins are forgiven. Totally a comprehensive statement of your sins are forgiven. I pray today that you would come to Jesus and you would ask for forgiveness and you could hear his voice say, your sins are all forgiven. Well, God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.